Well, it is time, so we're going to get started. I promise, I showered this week. I don't know what's going on. All right, if y'all would stand up, let's worship together. The splendor of the King Clothed in majesty Let all the earth rejoice Let all the earth rejoice And He wraps Himself in light Darkness tries you hide, trembles at his voice, trembles at his voice, and how great is our God, and sing with me how great is our God, and oh, we'll see how great. seated. Revelation chapter 4. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who is seated on the throne who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns before the throne saying, worthy are you, O Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will they existed and were created amen somebody say he's still alive alive. (laughs) i mean we said it sunday didn't we we proclaimed it we worshiped him for the the life that he gives us and we just gave him thanks but hey easter is something that we ought to celebrate every single day and every single day but uh and and every sunday that we gather together is a memorial to 
the resurrection of our Lord. And so uh, just keep that in your heart and mind. And don't, don't, don't let go of the thoughts that you had and the feelings that you had on Sunday. Let that, let that be your worship throughout the rest of the year until we celebrate again at the anniversary of his resurrection. Um, I, I had this conversation. I just want to share this real quick before Brother Greg comes up. This week in our in, our, in the hallway, we were talking, and we were talking about uh, Passover and the resurrection and uh, the Sabbath and all that, and why the church uh, chose to worship on Sunday rather than to continue to, to gather on the Sabbath, uh, which would have been Saturday. Why did they do that? Well, what they saw was that all of creation up till the resurrection of Jesus was like the first seven days. It's like a, that it represented that first seven days, that first week of God's work that He had done. Human history could be summed up in that seven days. But now because of the new life that we have in Christ, it's like we're living in a glorious eighth day in the new creation. And this is how the first century Christians saw their worship on Sunday. It wasn't that it was the first day of the week. It was, is, it, would, it was that it is the first day of a brand new creation. It exists forever. And we live in that. And so that's why they chose to gather and worship on the first day of the week. The, week, the day of the week that Jesus was resurrected. It's like that day started a whole new existence. Uh, a whole new creation. And so as we gather together this Sunday... We do it in remembrance of that, and I, and I hope that you'll be thinking about that until we gather to get again on Sunday. But I just had that thought, and I just had to get it out. I had to let somebody else think it too, because it's too big of a thought for me to keep to myself. All right? Well, Brother Greg's going to come, and he's going to challenge us this evening, and he's going to uh, talk to us about the, the, has a, the One Cry Highway. So we're going to look at that together in just a moment. Let's pray together. Father God, there are so many needs in, uh, in our church right now, Lord. You know them all. And so, Lord, I just want to pause and just thank you that you are sovereign over all of our lives. And, Lord, for the, the ones that have broken bones, we ask for you to heal them. Lord, those that are suffering with pneumonia and uh, having a hard time breathing or infection, God, that you would just rid that infection from their body. Yeah. Um, Lord, I pray that you would do a work in the lives of those who have lost loved ones. I know that there are uh, several among us, Lord, that have lost loved ones recently. And we pray, God, that you would touch them and bless them. And Father, for those of us that uh, just have the normal aches and pains, I pray, God, that you would um, just let them know uh, that your presence is always available and that your grace is sufficient. And Lord, for the, through every trial, Lord, you are good and you are on the throne. And Father, thank you so much for the knowledge of your presence here with us tonight. Go with us as we look into your word and as we study this last lesson together that we might allow you to impress these truths upon our hearts and we would grow closer to you and we would resemble the character of Christ more and more deeply. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Josh. Today was spring cleaning at my house. I don't know if you all do that, but Shelly gets it in her system where it's cleaning time. And um, when that happens, the temperature on the thermostat goes down to about 39 at my house. And that's why I got this jacket on. And uh, whew, she, Because she's, you wouldn't believe it, but she's a good cleaner. And, uh, and I could just stay back in my office and read while she's cleaning. Praise the Lord. <laughs> you know what? Uh, we are in our last chapter of One Cry. And uh, I'm glad I didn't hear an amen on that, you know. <laughs> but uh, think about it, because we're going to be asking this question at the end of the study, and we'll watch a video to kind of wrap things up tonight. But what now? What does God want me to do now? Uh, Ideally, I would encourage us all to start a group somewhere, you know, in, with your family and uh, maybe with some neighbors. 
uh, maybe with a Sunday school class or just uh, study it or you lead it and just lead a discussion. And it's easy to do when you have the videos, you just show the videos, you kind of talk about the videos and, and look at some key questions and uh, some prayer points at the end of the, each chapter. So it's a easy study to teach and to lead. So uh, let me just press on that a little bit. Uh, Lord, what do you want me to do now, now that it's over? Because I'm going to tell you something, that's the way that revival continues. That it didn't just end after our one cry weekend, but it can continue. And it all depends upon us and that we can be catalysts and facilitators for revival. So we're going to watch uh, the last video. We'll have some prayer time, and then I'm going to come up and just kind of highlight some things. And uh, then we'll have our prayer time at our tables. Hasn't this been wonderful to pray together on Wednesday nights like this where you're in, in a small group and you're praying and you're praying for needs that we lay out uh, on the screen, but some of the, some of the things that you got on your heart. And uh, I would just hope and pray that we continue to do that, not only uh, on Wednesdays, but also uh, in your own prayer life as you uh, pray with others, you pray with your family members, and also pray with people that God leads you to. And uh, just develop a habit of prayer to to pray without ceasing just has that desire in your heart to continue a life of prayer. Doesn't mean you got to just walk around with your eyes closed and pray all the time. That'd be tough, especially when you get behind the wheel. Don't do that. But we can have an attitude of prayer. And I think this is what the One Cry movement is all about. So let's watch the video and then we'll come back and talk about that. Welcome to this final session of the One Cry Experience. In the, in the final portion of the book, Byron, you talk about this One Cry Highway. What, tell us about this highway. Uh, Isaiah talked about that metaphor in Isaiah 40, uh, where we'll remember he says, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert what a highway for our God. You know, an amazing thing and how this uh, picture kind of plays out in the Eastern monarch back in the days of I, uh, Isaiah, uh, what it would be that this, this uh, monarch would have a king and when he wanted to go visit his people in another city, he would send messengers in advance to that destination city. But those in that city, when they heard that the king is coming and the messengers were telling them that, they would go out because the highways had kind of, and the pathways back then had been grown over, and, and uh, they had to just prepare the way for the king. And, 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 but, you know, I, I believe if we take all that, we can narrow it down here in this closing session to three steps. And I know, Bill, that first one is very much on your heart. Well, the question we ask in the One Cry book has, is this. Have you awakened to the national spiritual emergency? I think the question is, as we look at the highway and it's full of rocks and low places and mm -hmm. it's full of sin and need and all that, uh, it's kind of uh, um, head in the sand to just say, well, everything's fine. Uh, we're good. That, so that leads to no desperation, which leads to no prayer and, and no repentance. Mm -hmm. So I think part of the One Cry initiative is just to sound the trumpet call. And just say, folks, hey, there's something dramatically wrong. We're, we're sitting around saying, hey, we're fine, we're rich, we have no need of anything, and, uh, and yet we're poor and blind and naked, and we need the Lord so desperately. Mm. That's what the National uh, Spiritual Emergency document is about mm -hmm. that we've asked people to sign. Mm. But I think even more than that document is the heart of that document is coming to the real realization that things are not what they should be mm. and God is calling us to repent and to turn and to cry out mm. to Him. Mm. Uh, but really step two is there back in the book of Acts that we've been talking about and using kind of a foundation of mooring to all this and the ways of God. But in that passage, I mentioned earlier that there were really three types of people, those who were intercessors, those who would pray. Mm. And we aren't just talking... Uh, 
praying, but that are really engaged, really active, and actually connected to each other in that uniting and praying together through the One Christ site. And then also those who would share, uh, those who would share their voices. And, uh, and Bill, you want to talk about prayer, and then I want to jump into those voices here in a minute. But, uh, well, you know, uh, one of the interesting, really fascinating things about the First and Second Great Awakening is that uh, churches all across the United States signed agreements together mm -hmm. to join together for several years in a regular rhythm of prayer. Mm -hmm. uh, the National Prayer Committee here in the United States and others have, have um, uh, started that again mm -hmm. called the National Prayer Accord. And here's, here's what it is, that we would, we would agree together to pray weekly, mm -hmm. maybe on Saturday night for the preaching of the word the next day, mm -hmm. uh, to pray monthly as a church mm -hmm. that we would gather together just specifically to pray for revival, and then quarterly to gather together with other like-minded churches. Mm -hmm. And this is happening, Gary, across mm -hmm. the United States, as you know, uh, that churches are gathering together. Maybe it's five churches or 10 churches or 50 churches. They're gathering together, mm -hmm. like Reno, 94 different churches and ministries to gather together every quarter for a night of worship and a night of prayer, but very specifically targeted to pray for revival and spiritual awakening in a nation. And then to pray annually on the National Day of Prayer. One Cry actually uh, through Moody Broadcasting is doing a, a, a broadcast across the nation for revival on that uh, night. Wouldn't it be something if uh, all across the nation that churches and pastors and people just got in this rhythm of prayer, of crying out to God. And uh, what you just outlined here is found right in the appendix of, yes, I will, not, now what, in the appendix of this book. And, and then um, I have a burden, Bill, like, like you do for those who will pray, but for those who will really share. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you think of sharing, as it says in Acts 2, they, they shared the mighty acts of God. All they did is went and they shared their story. Uh, there are a bunch of storytellers, I call it, in revival throughout history. And uh, somebody said that the, the, flame of, the fame of revival spreads the flame of revival. Uh, revival spreads on the wings of testimonies. And we know that from history. And, but God has given us, I think, a unique time in history to be able to do that in a way that is uh, rapid mobilization. Uh, and just quickly here in that third great awakening that we've talked so much about, what people don't realize in the 10 years preceding that, there was this exponential uh, progress in all of technology, much like today. So what happened? The enemy used it for bad, but God's people saw the opportunity in Fulton Street, and they began to publish the stories and testimonies and show pictures of Fulton Street, and, and that's what spread the flames of revival. What an opportunity today if you're just a lay person, but you have a computer, you have access to the internet, you have some mobile device, you can tell your story and share the mighty acts of God of what he's doing in your life, what he's doing in your group, what he's doing in your community and church, and we can all share. And you know, the third part of that is to lead. As a, as a pastor, I have uh, men come to me all the time and they say, well, how do I lead my family? My wife's more spiritual than I am. <laughs> and uh, I say, I understand that dilemma, so is mine. Uh, but I say, you know, a leader is an initiator. When you have a military man who's uh, leading a group, he, he may not know more about every area that needs to be known, but he says, okay, let's go. He initiates. Mm -hmm. And so I think right now we have, we have pastors and we have lay leaders, but we have businessmen. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, I could start a prayer group. I, I, I could lead by uh, saying as a pastor, I'm going to start praying with other pastors in this city. Or we're going to have a night of prayer and we're going to invite two other churches, mm -hmm. you know, to join with us in this night of prayer for revival. Mm -hmm. I mean, God is very creative. Yeah. And so I don't need to tell people what to do. We just need to listen to the Holy Spirit and then just initiate, just lead upon God's initiation. Just do what he's telling us to do. So really that final step then is uh, after we've been awakened to the spiritual emergency and, and we say, Lord, what's our place? Do we pray? Do we just share our stories and, and, and really proclaim the hope of revival? Mm -hmm. uh, or do we have a, a place of influence where we can lead? 
So really that final step is a question to all of us and to those who are part of this series. What is it God wants me to do? Mm -hmm. What is it? Show me, God. We've talked through this whole series about this thread of revival called obedience. And my favorite definition of obedience is it's doing exactly what God says instantly and with a right heart attitude. And so as we pray on that final step and just say, Lord, what is it you want me to do? That we would just be open for God to use us just as a simple instrument for his glory, for the cause of the king and his kingdom in our day, in our era. Well, you know, we've been talking about prayer. We've been talking about revival. We've been talking about spiritual awakening. And what better way to end this time than to pray? I want to pray. And then Byron and then Bill, will you just close this time in prayer? Let's, let's bow before God together. The Apostle Paul prayed, For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, mm. that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and the length and the depth and the height, mm. and to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. Now unto him who was able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ever ask or think, according to the power which worked in us, Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Father, I pray that would be so in the hearts and in the lives of those who have joined us in this conversation. Father God, I pray that by your Holy Spirit, you will break our hearts. I pray, dear God, that we can no longer be complacent. Father, we expect the return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We're reminded of the words of Paul as he says, knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than when we first believed. But Father, we believe even more so the time of your return is near. And so, Lord, if you would, I ask, we pray, we desire that you'd raise up prayerful intercessors, dear God, who will stand in the gap on behalf of our nation, on behalf of our world. I pray, dear God, that you would do a work that only can be accomplished by the power of Christ moving in the power of the Holy Spirit. Thank you for your grace, God. We expect to see you show up in unique fashion in the days to come. Mm. And oh, God of heaven, I pray. Oh, would you open up the windows of heaven and come down? Lord, the mountains in our hearts, the mountains of bitterness and unforgiveness and the mountains of addictions and the mountains of temporal values and immorality and all those mountains, Lord, that stand between you and your glory and all that you want to accomplish. God, I just pray that you would tear them down, that they might fall down at your presence. And oh God, as Isaiah said, their eyes have not seen nor ears heard, neither has entered into the heart of man the things that you have prepared for those that would steadfastly seek you. Oh God, if we were to just collectively put together in some list everything we've ever seen you do, we've ever heard you do, we've ever read about you doing, and we put all together, Lord, I still believe we've not seen what you can do on behalf of those who would exercise faith and belief that it's not too oh God. late, oh God. that God, you can come Thank and that you, you will come by faith come as Lord we Jesus. trust you and seek you with all of our hearts. God, thank you for those out there. God, for those one cry family who have said, look, we understand it's a spiritual emergency. I thank you that you've put it in their heart to participate in this series just to take one more step forward as an army of people who will give themselves over of seeking your glory for your namesake only. And God, I pray that you'd bless them. I pray that you encourage them. I pray that you would show them what is it that you want them to do and that, God, you would just give them, flood them with the grace to obey. And, oh, God, I look forward with great anticipation of that day, that moment, when you do come with your spirit in great power and do your great work for your great glory. Do it. Do it again, Lord. Do it again. And, Father, we 
thank you for all those across the country who are joining their hearts and their minds together to study your word and to think and to pray together about what it would take on our part, what you're calling us to do, to cooperate with you in exalting your son. And Lord, we pray that you would forgive us. We pray that you would cleanse us. We pray that you would purify us. Lord, we pray that across a nation, a great spirit of repentance would settle down upon us. And we would realize, Lord, that we don't love you like you've called us to love you. And we would lay down every idol, every God, every love that we have that has taken preeminence over you. Lord, purify your bride. Lord, it's your bride. Purify your bride so the world would see what a matchless husband you are. And then, Father, we pray that we would be instantly responsive to the promptings of your spirit and the illumination of your word. Lord, whatever you initiate, we pray that we would follow you. We just follow you and not quench your spirit. Lord, it just seems you want to do so much more. And we, we stop that by resisting your spirit's voice and your word's instruction. And so, Lord, I would pray that, that you would, this would not be the end. This, this last session of this study would just be the beginning, Lord. And a growing burden would come in our heart and growing prayer and growing obedience and growing repentance. And Father, then that you would be merciful, Lord, to open up the heavens and to invade once again so that your purposes could be filled and thousands and thousands of people could be brought to faith in your matchless son. We pray that, Lord, not so our lives will be a little bit better. We pray that, Father, so that you would receive the honor and the glory and the praise that you so rightly deserve, but which we've deprived you of so often. In Jesus' name and for his sake, we pray. Amen. Amen. They started out the uh, session tonight with a passage out of Isaiah. And let me just read it again. In the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low. And rough ground shall become level, the rugged places a plain. And the glory of the Lord will be revealed. And all the people will see it together. This was the passage that, if you remember, John the Baptist took up and became the main focus of his message, of his preaching, and that was a message of repentance. And his message was for the people, in order to prepare the way for the coming of the king, Jesus, they needed to make sure that their hearts were ready to receive him. That it just wasn't enough for them to just say, yes, this is our Messiah. But they had to do some spade work in their own hearts and lives. They had to fill in the gaps. They had to pull up roots. They had to make sure that their hearts were at, were a appropriate place where the king could travel and take up residence and set up his throne in our hearts. So that's the message, and I think that's... Uh, the main message of this whole study is that it's a call to repentance. Um, tonight, what I want to do is to look at the awareness of uh, spiritual awakening. And the spiritual awareness is the key, I think, to bring us to revival. Now, if you look at that declaration of national spiritual emergency, we've, we've passed that out already. I've had you sign that. And just by way of review, you can just kind of scan through that and read through it. And it's not enough just to kind of do it, uh, you know, in kind of a superficial way, but we got to get the, to the heart of the whole issue. There has to be an awareness of the plight and in the dire straits that we are in as a country. Do you realize that? Let me give you an illustration. There is a book, there is a law in the books in the state of New York right now that was passed back in the 1880s. And it says that it is a crime, it's against the law, to commit adultery. Well, that's a pretty good law, you know. 
And that was put on the books in the late 1800s, probably as a result of the revivalism taking place in that state, the state of New York, started with Charles Finney, and they called that area up near Rochester. You remember the, the friendliest city in the nation? You remember where it was that Byron talked about when he was here? Where was it? Friendliest nation, uh, city in the nation. It was voted. Rochester, New York. And that was that burned, they called it the burned over district. They called it that because there was so much fire of revival that swept through that northern, especially the upper state New York area where revivals took place. And, um, and it was an amazing thing. And that probably set the stage for that law to be put on the books and passed through the legislature of New York. Now, that's being reviewed right now. I just heard about it today. And the people in the New York legislature laugh that to scorn and saying that is so ridiculous that that's on the books. It's so ridiculous that that was ever passed in the law. And they would read it aloud and laugh at it, mocking that law. Folks, that gives you an idea where we've slid as a nation. Now, I know New York State is different than Alabama, and Florida. However, we are in it, in it up to our necks right now. We have sunk to an all-time low spiritually and morally. And unless you understand that, there isn't that sense of urgency to pray for revival. But I hope as a result of these eight weeks of studying the book and, and, and hearing uh, from Byron and Trey and others, uh, during the week of the One Cry Weekend, I hope you've come to that awareness that we're in desperate re need right now as a nation. And I think our churches are in desperate need of reviving. I just don't say that glibly. That's just, uh, that, can, that could just become a cliche. Our church needs revival. Well, everybody says that, all, uh, you know, about fall time when you have uh, the, the uh, you know, once a year or revival, or if you have it, we had we used to have it twice a year up in Kentucky, but sometimes that can just become you just kind of go through the motions and you miss what the main message is. So, really, the heart of the issue is an awareness. And let me remind you of that diagram on page fifty-one. If you have a book, you can look at the diagram. I got a picture of it here. That if you didn't if you didn't bring your book, you can see the diagram here charting the cycle of revival. And you look at those stages of revival, and, the, and the, each stage, there's six of them that you go through. It's obvious that God's people turn away. I think God's people in the United States have turned away, and yet, because of God's love, what does he do? What's the next stage? He disciplines us. And because he disciplines us, and because of decline and turning away from him, there is this judgment. Now, this is hard to put in words, but I think what I just said about what's happened in New York is kind of an, an example of that. We are under, right now, the remedial judgment of God. And I don't think a lot of people even realize that, and that's why there's no desperation in our prayers. And that's why there's no sense of urgency. You know, to sign the declaration of spiritual emergency that you can read in your book, there has to be that awareness before we cry out. Do you get where we're at? I think on this cycle, look again on page 51, very important part of this study. you got to figure out where we're at as a nation, where we're at as a church on that cycle of revival. What stage? I think um, our friend up at the uh, assembly, Brownsville Assembly of God, he, I talked to him one day, and I said, where do you think we are in that cycle? And um, his name is um, Evan. Where do you think we are? And he said, I think we're somewhere between judgment and crying out. And the problem is, is that a lot of churches don't even have an awareness how far we've fallen. And I think he hit the nail on the head. So that's where we're at. 
And I think just kind of review that and that whole stage of revival because when you sense where we're at, if you see where we're at on the cycle and those stages of revival, and the, before we can cry out after judgment comes, there has to be an awareness, an awareness that we are under the remedial judgment of God. We've talked about it throughout this study. When you look at the level of crime in our nation, when you look at cities, not just, uh, not just in Chicago, in Los Angeles, in New York City, Pensacola. You know, I've been made aware that we have gangs in Pensacola. Never knew that, but it's here. So there is an awareness. That, that's part of it. And then, uh, you know, they're talking about undoing what we undid in 20, was it 2022, when we overturned, overturned Roe versus Wade. And they're talking about trying to bring a national law that makes it a law nationally to have unlimited access to abortions. And that's going to be pushed in this election coming up, you better believe it. Listen, folks, we're under the remedial judgment of God, and I'm just trying to get us aware, aware of the need to cry out, to cry out in desperation, in urgency. Lord, rend the heavens and come down like Isaiah prayed in chapter 64. Rend the heaven and any mountain that stands in the way in my life that prevents me in experiencing you the way I need to experience you and know you, Lord, that you would just level it. And Lord, get it out of the way. Three things in the book of Acts that we need to look at. They, they mentioned it, but I want to mention it, go a little bit deeper. I think the first thing in chapter 1 Verse 14 of Acts, uh, we've uh, hit on this time and time again. What were they doing in the upper room? They were praying. They were united in prayer. That united prayer is what brought about Pentecost. The united prayer is what sparked the revival in the church that set forth the awakening where you had this, this unprecedented uh, advancement of the gospel in a phenomenal way where scores of people, tens of thousands of people would come to faith in Jesus Christ. We've seen that in history of the church here in America. Five times we've seen that where you have an unbelievable amount of people come to faith in a very short period of time. That's called spiritual awakening. Different from revival. Revivals for the church. Spiritual awakening is for the lost. So we see that starting in the book of Acts. So the first thing that I think we need to look is that there are three things that they hit on, and I want to—I uh, would call your attention to at the end of the, uh, of the chapter. Uh, pray, share, and lead. Those three things. Let's talk a little bit about sharing. We've, we've hit on prayer. Um, sharing. You remember when... Uh, what Byron was talking about, that the fame of revival spreads by the flame of revival. And when we start giving testimonies about what God is doing all across the nation in our churches, just telling what God is doing in your own life, you know, we all have our own stories. And we can tell the story of our experience with Christ and also the, the story that, that hopefully that uh, sharing our personal testimony will transition into an opportunity to share the gospel with others and share the message of the gospel and all the tenets of the gospel. And, uh, but I think that we need to, to look at that, does, that revival spreads on the wings of testimonies. I like that. Let me give you two examples. There was a uh, young man at Baylor University, didn't get to meet him, but uh, apparently a year ago before they even had the National Collegiate Day of Prayer back in February, uh, he had a skiing accident and he blew out his knee and he had to be on crutches and he was in pain. He couldn't even sleep at night when he came back to the campus after his skiing trip. And, uh, but he went and asked for prayer. They were having these prayer groups at what's called FM 72, where they pray, the students at Baylor prayed for 72 hours straight. Well, they prayed for him. They prayed for him, 
and he got healed. And his knee that was blown out because of this skiing accident, suddenly he was able to throw away his crutches, unwrap the bandage on his knee, and to walk around as if it never happened. Now that happened, that's a testimony that I've heard and by reliable people. Here's the real interesting part. You know what he did? Well, he lived in the dorms where he went on the first floor of the dorms. There must have been 25, 30 people on that first floor. He shared his testimony about what God did for him. And you know what did? Everybody on that first floor got saved. <laughs> you, know, you know, they heard the story of God's miraculous healing, and they wanted to know more about this God who heals, and the gospel was shared of God's like James Poole, who works with our One Cry team, and he's been on the ground there at Baylor University. But that's a story. And the, uh, you know, revival spreads on the wings of testimony. The other one is more recent, and that is a young lady by the name of Grace. She's a student at Florida State University. Well, she was up at Auburn University back in September where it started out as a meeting, uh, and they were having this young lady come in with a famous preacher, uh, from Waco by the name, they just call him JP, Jonathan Padako or something like that. But anyway, very famous guy. And her name was Jenny Allen. And she spoke at that thing. And then just uh, people started uh, uh, praising the Lord. And the Lord moved on that, that student body at Auburn University, folks. Auburn University. We're talking about, you know, where Auburn is. And God was working, and before it was over, like two or three hundred people were baptized in that pond outside. Well, that, that student was part of that, and she went back to Florida State, and this has been recent, and her name is Grace, the name of my uh, first grandchild, Grace. I love that name. And, uh, but she got with her roommate, they started praying, praying for Florida State, the second largest partying school in the nation. Listen, they know how to guzzle the beer, folks, and, and worse than that, probably chase it down with whiskey. And, um, and you know, they, God moved in the same way. God answered their prayer. And this has been just three weeks ago. And they have a pond, they have a fountain out in front of Florida State. I don't know if you've ever seen it. I've not been there. But they say when you're a first-year student, you get drunk, and then you get thrown into that fountain. That's an initiation fee for every student, for crying out loud. But uh, not that night. That's what, that was the scene for baptismal service. And there was about 300 people that got baptized. No telling how many people got saved during that night. Listen, folks, God is on the move. And he's working in the hearts of so many people in that age bracket of 16 to about 26 years old. And uh, so when I hear stories like that and I hear that God is moving, God is hearing our prayers for revival just like we've been praying for, for well, really, uh, even before uh, we started this study, I think we've been praying as a church for a revival. Let's continue to do that. The last thing is that we need to lead, and that's where you come in. You, you, and you, everybody sitting at this table, and that is how, how can you lead? Well, you know, uh, God can raise up preachers, uh, I think uh, Josh would do a great job in leading a small group somewhere in maybe his neighborhood with some other, uh, maybe just get with some other pastors and study this book. You could lead a, a session. And, um, and then some of our deacons, uh, guys like David, who could uh, teach and, and, and share this. But listen, God can use businessmen. He can use ex-Navy people. He can use ex-service people, servicemen and women and use you to be a, here's the word, listen to what I'm saying here, facilitator of a revival. Facilitator of a revival. What do you do? Take the book and read it. Get the, I'll send you the videos, and you get it started. And that answers the question that was raised at the very end. Lord, what do you want me to do now? I think he wants every one of us to start some kind of a group. Do it with your kids. Do it with your grandkids. Do it with whoever the Lord leads you to do it with to lead a study of this little book. And I think that would be a source of inspiration for them. I know it will. And blessing. And you would be doing what the disciples did in the book of Acts. Again, those three things. Remember what they were? Pray, 
share. Well, that's what they did uh, after the Holy Spirit came on them in power in chapter 2. And even when they were persecuted and threatened in chapter 4, you are not to speak in this name any longer. And remember what they did right after they were threatened? Had a prayer meeting. Better, what better thing to do after you get threatened? They had a prayer meeting, and they prayed, God, give us what? Oh, change the leadership in our country. Now, they didn't pray for that. They didn't pray, Lord, get us out of this sticky wicket. They didn't pray for that. They prayed, God, give us what? Boldness. Boldness to share the glorious gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Share and then lead. And some of these leaders that God raised up, he raised, listen, he raised up guys like Peter and made him a preaching machine. More important than that, he raised up some deacons. <laughs> Stephen, Philip, he raised up some deacons that were powerful in the Lord. Stephen, he's martyred, but hey, praise the Lord. We're only here a short period of time, folks. What better way to go out as a martyr for Jesus, being bold for Jesus and sharing his gospel and the power of the Holy Spirit. Well, I think that sums it up. <laughs> what is it that God wants us to do? Two things. I'm going to just repeat what Byron said. Have radical obedience. There was a missionary that we heard that his testimony grabbed my heart back in 1983 when I heard him at a world mission conference. He came to my church in Bardstown, Kentucky. His name is Carl Hunker, and he said, what you need to be on the mission field is... Radical abandonment. Yeah, reckless abandonment. You ever, had, you ever heard that word? I love that. Reckless abandonment. That's what it takes. In other words, unswerving commitment to follow Jesus at any cost. And that's, what's, and that's what grabbed my heart and saying, Lord, I'll go anywhere you want me to go. And that little, I don't know, it would take me 38 years to the mission field. But, hey, I don't regret it. Best time I've ever spent in my life. And God bless that time. I can share with you tomorrow about that. If you'll come to Keenagers, I'm going to share about that at length. But uh, what do you want me to do? And listen. Be open as you listen to hear what he wants you to do. I'll bet you anything God is calling these deacons that are here right now to start something. Let me just be so bold as to challenge you as deacons. To start a, start a study. Lead it. Get the, get the video. Show it. And then get, I'm nervous. I can't preach like Brother Josh. Well, not many people can, folks. But, but you can lead a Bible study. You, you can, all you got to do is take these questions at the end of every chapter. And, and pray together. That's, a, that's the most important thing at the end of every session, praying together. And that's what we're going to do right now. We're going to pray together. And um, you guys got enough of that. I'm going to join this good-looking group right here, if I could. And uh, let's just go to the Lord in prayer. And with that question in mind, Lord, what would you have me to do right now? Okay.
This is a great tool to use to pray through. We didn't, I, our table didn't get to this, but this is just kind of praying through these 12 verses out of Isaiah 64 is a great tool to use if you end up leading a small group on one cry. This is a, it's a great way to end our study. Uh, one prayer request, and that is, you remember when they were talking about the advance, the advancements in technology back in the late 18, uh, 1850s, telegraph, uh, and, and that was a big deal back then, to be able to, I, I saw something on Lincoln, he would wait in a room getting uh, word through telegraph how things were going in the Civil War, and, uh, but that helped spread the gospel and spread the news of the revival that was taking place in 1858 in New York City. And I got thinking about that. Think about the advance of advancements that we've made in technology through email. It used to be email was the big deal. But now you get on Zoom. And we right now, and I don't say this bragging, but it looks like we may have an opportunity to open up a, we already have a One Cry Indonesia, as you well know, a One Cry India, One Cry Rwanda. But there are three other possibilities. One, One Cry Cuba, One Cry Colombia, and uh, perhaps Uganda, where Joe's cousin uh, serves. We've made contact with him. So through email and through just being able to network with people on a, uh, in a large-scale way because of the advancements made in technology are, un, are remarkable. So just as we uh, close out in prayer, uh, I'm going to ask Josh if you would close us out in prayer, praying for us that the Lord would open up doors for us to start something like that. Uh, we've already passed out books, uh, many books in Spanish, already translated the, the One Cry book in Spanish, sent them to Cuba. We're waiting on word. I talked, we had a meeting with uh, Gabo, uh, Gabriel Vargas, and about eight Hispanic leaders. And one guy who lives in Colombia is interested in doing something like this in his country. He's the He's a leader of the uh, Colombian Baptist Convention. So just pray that the Lord would open up doors like that for us to see God move in a, an incredible way and just thank the Lord for uh, opportunities. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'll be going to Cantonment in the morning uh, to visit with some pastors there, some churches in Cantonment that have heard about what's going on in Pensacola with One Cry Pensacola, and they're very interested in that. Um, so uh, you can just be praying for those pastors to capture this vision and and uh, want to lead their churches to unite their hearts together and, and pray for revival. Um, so if you bow your heads, close your eyes, and let's close this out with prayer. Father, I just thank you for what you've done in each of our hearts uh, through this study as well as everything that's led up to this study, our One Cry Weekend, uh, the prayer efforts that we have for the 24-hour the uh, unceasing prayer. And Father, just how you've revived even my heart, I thank you for that, Lord. I, I needed to be revived. And I know that each of us, Lord, we have that need uh, to stay revived and to live revived to have life abundant on this earth and, and not, Lord, to let the world pull us down and and get and even, Lord, just go through the motions of, of living. But, Lord, to, to live on purpose and to live with a, a sense of urgency for the lost souls around us and to see your glory known among us. And, Father, I pray that that would go with us and it wouldn't cease here, Lord, even though this study is ending, that, Lord... What you're doing has just begun, and we thank you for that. And I pray, Lord, that you would spark a fire within every one of the churches in this county. Lord, that they would, they would be revived just as Myrtle Grove has been revived. I pray, God, that the other churches would, would be revived as well. And, Lord, that they'd see your glory manifest, Lord. If there's churches here or anywhere in our nation, Lord, that are preaching things that aren't true, that just man's wisdom or, or some other psychology, psychology or just nonsense, Lord, that you would revive the pulpits in America so that your gospel would be the, the main thing that's said. And, Lord, that anything else, Lord, would just fall by the wayside. 
And Father, I pray that you would revive the hearts of your people, Lord, that we can't do it through legislation and we can't do it through an election. But Father, you can change us in a moment by changing the hearts of your people. And I pray, God, that they would turn to you, that the people that call themselves Christians in this nation, Lord, that they would turn to you. Lord, that's my prayer. That's my earnest prayer tonight. And Father, I know that you've heard all the prayers that have been lifted up tonight, so we give you the glory and the praise and the credit ahead of time before all that you will do, knowing that you are a good God and your purpose is true and it cannot be changed. And Father, we just thank you for what you are going to do. And we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, God bless you. We'll see you Sunday. Hey, bring somebody with you to church.